So first of all, um, really want to welcome you all to the Housing Transformation Summit. Hopefully you know where you're at and why you're, <laughs> why you're here. And um, it'll be, if this is your first time to the summit, it's a really great way to get some little sound bites on a lot of different topics. So, and so we've got five different sessions that we're going through and it kind of follows the customer journey and kind of the digital journey. So we kind of organized around that concept. We can't cover everything. Uh, we would have to be here for three months, uh, but we tried to pick out some highlights of what we thought would be um, interesting. So today, this first session, we're gonna be talking about attracting. So you can do all kinds of amazing things, but if you don't actually attract people, it's kind of like, if a bear is screaming in the woods and nobody hears them, like, did it happen? I don't, I don't know. So you have to uh, attract people um, and, not, <laughs> and not detract them. So very important. So we're gonna do just a quick tee up that applies a little bit to this session, but also to the sessions as we go through the week uh, to kind of get our head in the game. So this is like my <laughs> favorite slide of all times. You know, marketing used to be somewhat simple. It was very expensive and um, very elegant and very posh. And we spent a lot of money on our brand and in boardrooms and high-end advertising. And it was kind of fun. Everybody was in sexy cocktail attire and had martinis and <laughs> smoked cigarettes. And then of course we all figured out that gives us diseases. So that's not such a good thing, but kind of glamorous, right? And when you look at those days, from a home builder perspective, we controlled the dialogue, or at least we thought we controlled the dialogue because there was really no way to find out about us unless they showed up. And then we had our canned pitch, uh, whether it was good or bad, they had to kind of sit through that pitch to, if they really wanted to understand anything about us. And we liked it because we controlled that dialogue they had to hear what we had to say about us. And that was kind of what they knew about us. And that was really, you know, very clean and simple. Um, the challenge is the world has really changed. And I love this from Google. It's called the zero moment of truth. So if you think about how marketing and sales used to work, you would do some marketing, you know, stimulus. So you'd run an ad, you'd run a newspaper ad, you'd have a billboard, you'd have, TV commercial, whatever your advertising was, customer would come see you and then they would either buy or not buy. And then they either had a great experience or a bad experience and they might tell a few people, right? So they tell friends, family, you know, but that's kind of where it stopped. Um, what's happened and gotten a lot more complicated is what we call the zero moment of truth. So the same process happens in that you're doing some marketing, you're out there, the customer is somewhat interested. The challenge is before they ever come to see you, they go do a ton of research, right? They look at all your reviews, they look at Better Business Bureau, they talk to everyone. They know more about you than you know about you before they show up, right? So it's challenging in that you are no longer controlling that message and that dialogue. Um, it's good and bad if you have a great reputation and you do a really good job, and we're gonna talk about that today, it's awesome. If you don't, you're very, very, very exposed. So what happens today is I go do uh, my research, I come see you, I buy or I don't buy. If I buy, I have a great experience, a bad experience. I tell everyone about that experience. So that then feeds back into this loop for the next customer who is out there and has their zero moment of truth. So a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today and through the week is really about that importance of that digital brand and that digital presence. Um, you know, and the net is the world has changed and we've changed. If you think about how we interact with brands today, right? We expect an app, we expect information, we expect it when it's when we're ready to, to do it. They don't want you know, a lack of transparency, they want to see everything. That's what we expect from brands and that's what customers and our buyers and prospects expect of us as well. 
and we call it the prosumer. And basically, we want self-service, we want 24 by 7 access, we want transparency, we want to know the pricing, everything, don't make me call, don't make me drive across town, you know. And I kind of like it to, you know, uh, Veruca from Willy Wonka, if you remember, she was like, I want it and I want it now, right? And that's kind of what we've all become in that sense. And I find myself, I get so impatient if there's any kind of digital disruption or I can't get what I want and I just I just won't work with a brand because they're not respectful of what I'm expecting. And home building is not immune. So we know it's hard. We know that we have um, a million options. We have a million SKUs. We have lots of products. We know it's complicated. Consumers don't care. They don't care that that's a hard thing for us to do. Um, and so we have that same expectation as prospects and buyers are coming to work with us. And it's kind of interesting, I pulled this slide up. This was uh, pre-COVID and I used to present and talk about digital transformation. And I would show the slide and it would say 33% of buyers, and this was pre-COVID, would buy a house sight unseen. They would make an offer in a house and they've never seen it. And I mean, literally builders would be like throwing tomatoes from the audience going, no way, no way, that can't be. But if you think about it, especially if you're a millennial, you don't know how a house is built and the construction and you know it's gonna get inspected anyway and it's like, why do I have to drive across town to see it? Or maybe I live in a different city. So this was considered crazy, like crazy talk. If you fast forward, we then had our little uh, COVID accelerant and in December of 2020, 63% of homes were made sight unseen. So people were making offers. And you might kind of go, well, that was COVID. We don't really have COVID anymore. Or do we? I don't know. Do we have COVID? <laughs> it's years. It's, it's always. Some people it's do. It's all around us. I don't know. I, think I don't know. Yeah. Um, anyway, I think Hopefully it's over. Know, right? um, but you can say, oh, that's just crazy because that was just COVID time. But as you know, a lot of things, new behaviors that we adopted during COVID have stayed with us. We are all very different in terms of how we act. And I think builders and buyers both got a sense that a lot of that stuff we had, we made people come in to do, you really don't have to do that. So it's moved on. It may not quite be 63%, but it's somewhere between 33 and 63. And if you didn't notice on that other slide, millennials were at 41%. So as our population ages and we have more millennials, and guess what, we're gonna talk about Gen Z's in a minute, that's really scary, um, they're coming <laughs> in too. So as part of that, we have builders now going all the way to really embracing buy online. Let me go, let me go to Zillow and I'll see the property and then I'll click over to the builder and I can just go ahead and buy online. It's really that simple. And I'm, I'm gonna talk in a minute, it's not about we don't want them to come see us. We don't want to force them to come see us. So if they choose and they're ready to buy, why wouldn't we let someone buy? If you're in sales, never say no, <laughs> right? Right, Rexanne? Mm -hmm. uh, always. So you'll see Taylor Morrison, he's enabled us. CBH um, has really embraced it. TriPoint Homes has really, really embraced kind of the digital customer experience. You can go through the entire process. You can design it, you can make a down payment, you get all the way through the entire process. So builders are embracing that and that's what we're gonna be talking a lot about this week is how do you do that and what are some of those tools? Um, and the net is the online experience is the experience. So that's your brand. Your brand is not what you dreamed up in the boardroom or that an agency helped you come up with and it's very beautiful. The brand is what's being said about you online and what they see and what they experience with you online. And if that's good, they may still come see you and that may be a great thing and that may be part of your process. So we're not saying get rid of that, but if you don't have a great experience online, they won't show up. That just won't be happening. So you won't make that short list. Um, and that digital desire, it's only accelerating. And Gen Z's are here. They are actually buying houses. It's hard to believe. And I have a Gen Z, uh, and he fits the profile perfectly, right? Never wants to talk to anybody on the phone, and everything's done on his phone. I mean, that's just the way life is. 
Um, interesting thought when we talk about uh, physical retail here in a moment, but this is not gonna go away. It's gonna get even more digital. The demands are gonna get even stronger as we go forward. And so I do wanna talk about the physical experience because there is an assumption sometimes that when we talk about digital, that we're talking about just online. And we're not talking about just online. That digital experience, uh, a new word that we're using is fidgetal. So it's the physical digital experience. That digital experience has to carry through. So if your prescribed sales process or the way that you want customers to engage with you is you do want them to come in to see you, don't make them, give them another avenue, but if they're gonna come see you, your physical retail experience has to be digitally savvy too for a multitude of reasons. One, if you're super sexy online, you're super digital and you got all this whiz bang stuff and then they come in and you got a bunch of spreadsheets and <laughs> paper and there's not an iPad to be found, that's very jarring and they don't know who you are. They're like, well, I thought you were one thing and you're not the same thing. So that has to be the same. The information has to be the same. If it's on your website or it's out on your social media presence, it had better be present in your physical retail experience as well. So make sure that it's seamless and offer self-serve and assistance. So they're coming to see you in one of the sessions later this week, we'll talk about they're showing up, but they may wanna do some self-serving. They may not wanna be pounced on the moment <laughs> that they, they walk in the door, right? Let them self-serve, let me be in control as a buyer. And last but not least, be Instagrammable. So have amazing things that are worth showing up for, right? If I'm just gonna show up and it's just really not very exciting, why did I do that? But if you have augmented reality and I can experience home on a lot, or I can you know, touch and feel things and experience things, then it's worthwhile to show up. So don't want you to mistake that we're a pure digital, 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 and we're saying get rid of physical and retail. What we're saying is if you are going to have a physical retail, make sure it's got the appropriate uh, digital infusion. So with that, our first session with our illustrious uh, panel, very long title for this, but basically it's about how do you attract online home shoppers? How do you pe get people to want to engage with you? So we have an amazing panel with us today. We have Scott from Zillow and Anya from Anugo and Tim from Avid, who just landed like five just minutes ago. So <laughs> he gets in, like, huh? you know, hustle awards. Words. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then we have Monica from ECI. Hey. And then my really good uh, long-term friend, Roxanne from KB Home. So across this group, we're gonna walk through just some very different facets. And this group kind of came up with what did they think was the most important thing to really think about as we're thinking about a trapped. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mr. Scott. Okay. Yes. Start it, okay. And I'll start my timer as well, ready? Eight minutes <laughs> and go. Hey, uh, so I, I think we're gonna start big picture with, with my portion of the, of the presentation to, to paint the, the picture of the landscape. And, and I don't have to tell you guys, you guys are living in the landscape right now. You know what's out there right now. But what we were seeing in the end of 23 and into 24 was a lot of momentum in new construction. And, and the opportunity is still there. Uh, builders and, and those of us in this industry, to Monica's point, we just need to capture that um, and, and you know, capture that momentum. And, and you know, when it comes to that zero moment of truth, when they do finally reach out to you, you know, maximize that opportunity because they have done their research and I feel like my microphone is going left or right. Um, you know, capture, capture that momentum and because they have done their research prior to reaching out to you. Uh, a lot of what I found today that I'm going to share with you today, I don't have time to share the entire report, but if you're not familiar with it, every year we put together what's called a consumer housing trend report. Really, really great data in there. I'm not even a data person, but great trends and what resonates with buyers uh, today in new construction. So this year was no different. We surveyed about 6,500 folks who have bought in the past year or two, and then just ask them what's important to them. So like I said, I don't have time to go over the entire report, but I picked out about five nuggets that maybe you can implement. And, and then if you want to, there's a QR code here at the end of the presentation. If you guys want to snap that and download, feel free to do that. 
All right, so no surprise to you guys, um, new construction buyers are watching the bottom line more than ever. Um, money is tight. I just found a, a funny meme the other day and I thought it was appropriate on Instagram. And it said, um, the devil wears Kirkland. The devil, the de she no longer wears you know, Prada. Prada. The devil wears Kirkland in this economy. Uh, so I thought that was very appropriate. But 89% of new construction buyers say the budget is highly important, staying on the bottom line, or, or they're keenly focused on the bottom line. Uh, and if you guys, if buyers or builders need to stay competitive, you know, rate buy downs are seeing a lot of attraction, uh, especially as these interest rates, and I'm sorry, but interest rates where they are, my goodness, we're, we're tired of talking about them. But in order to get those buyers off the fence, these rate buy downs are really helping. They also reported to us that about 56% said that they are using gifts from families or friends to help with the down payment as well. And that number, that number has grown a little bit. Only new construction home, please. Uh, when new construction buyers were looking for homes, they only wanted to see these types of houses. They didn't want to worry about resale or existing homes, anything like that. They only wanted to see, about 42% reported, they only wanted to focus in on new construction. And that's a trend that's grown for the past three straight years. I think you mentioned the pandemic. I don't know if this is pandemic related, but this is more inventory related on the resale side. Is that, is that market, that, that, you know, that, that pool is, is shrinking now more than ever, these, these buyers are considering new construction. And this is a real opportunity for builders to lean into those new features that you can find in a new home versus those that are existing right now. Flaunt your features. Uh, marketers in here, we talked about it, make it, make sure it's Instagrammable, but also I'd like to put a caveat on that. Oftentimes these buyers reported to us that three in four of these buyers have a pet. 66% of those said they had a dog. Hmm. So if you have pet friendly features in your communities, in your homes, whether it's, I saw a dog wash in the garage, which was awesome. I wish I had that. Um, you know, make sure that's apparent in your Instagram posts. Make sure that's apparent in your marketing materials because they are treating these pets as family. And if you're a dog owner or a pet owner, you know they're family. And I'll fight you on it if you feel otherwise. Uh, unfortunately for the kids in the family, they're part of the family too. You know, they're, they're also, they're competing for the pets as being, you know, family status. But kids are also considered obviously family. So if you have family features uh, like parks, like playgrounds, like sandboxes, things like that, make sure those are apparent in your materials also. Those homes typically sell on average four to five days faster, um, especially those that are listed as being in walkable neighborhoods. So if you have libraries and things like that nearby, make sure that that's out there. Pets are family and kids are family, don't forget. <laughs> being smart is important, uh, not only in everyday life, but also when it comes to their new homes. Uh, new construction, they want smart homes. Uh, they, 63% of buyers, they viewed smart home capabilities as highly important. I think about that stat all the time as I retrofit my house from 2002 with rings and thermostats and everything else and smart locks. It'd be much easier to move into a house that was ready to go, you know. And this is a trend that's growing, you know, thanks in part to the pandemic, but it's up 29%, about 30% since 2019. And we mentioned the demographics uh, earlier. Almost four out of five new construction buyers are Gen X or younger. Um, the biggest portion of that, of course, are millennials. They're the largest home buying group out there. And so if you think about it, when it comes to smart technology, these are digital natives. These are people who have lived with this their entire lives. So why wouldn't it carry over into their homes as well? What are we looking at here? So we asked them, and this is really in part to COVID, uh, and this is that trend that has changed business, the way buyers and their, and their behaviors have really interacted with listings online. It's stuck around. So we basically asked them, do you agree with this statement? I wish that more listings had 3D tours available. And that dark green, is that dark, well, that, that bluish greenish is new construction. The light green is existing uh, home buyers. Um, new construction buyers said 72% of the time, yes, I wish that these listings had more 3D tours on them. They want that immersive technology. They want to see the house, be in the house before being in the house. Does that make sense? Um, it saves you a lot of time, it saves them a lot of time, and those listings that don't have this type of technology on them get pushed to the side. They just automatically get weeded out. If it's just simply static photos, or maybe even not even that, 
they get pushed to the side. But as soon as they see a floor plan or they see a video walkthrough or you know something like that, they're going to click on it. So if you have that type of technology, use it. Um, it new construction buyers typically are a little more keen mm -hmm. than existing home sales or home, home buyers, home shoppers. Uh, they reported, like 9 out of 10 reported using at least one piece of technology when they're, when they're looking at listings online, from e-signatures to video walkthroughs to floor plans, you name it. They want this type of technology. It creates more stickiness, if you will. Now, I would be remiss to say uh, if I didn't share, but we actually have a product that we created at Zillow um, using some technology where a photographer goes in and creates you know, takes these gorgeous photos, and then of course there's AI behind the scenes that creates a floor plan from it. So as the users online, they can navigate by way of floor plans or listing photos or the 3D home, you know, itself. So they can click on the dots and, and navigate through the house. But with the floor plan up there in the upper right hand corner, you can see where they are. Uh, it's pretty cool technology because that's what consumers want. That's what resonates with buyers. And that's one trend that we have seen, among others, that has stuck around. Wow. Yeah. All right, so I'm done. Uh, if you guys want more information, like I said, super comprehensive, goes much more into detail than I ever could describe. But there's a QR code. There's also my email if you want more information. Happy to be a resource for you. Awesome. Well, and just to FYI for everyone at the end, we should have some time for questions, or you can always grab us at the connections reception or whatever. So are you telling me that, like, like there's more dog people than cat people? Is that what you're saying? I'm just reporting the fact. <laughs> okay. Do you even have a dog for the... I have two. Okay. I have my wife's say. dog and then I have my dog. Okay, but like... <laughs> my wife's dog. Okay, but, but what about yeah. this kid? Let's just do a poll in this room. Right? I have kids. Dog. Yeah. Oh, he has kids. Okay. I have kids. I have kids. We're not I, supposed to have favorites, but yeah. Yeah. truth be told, I love the dog. I was a little worried about, yeah. You got really shy with the dogs and you're like, well, the kids are there too. Okay. And good. then there's the kids. Yeah, the kids. Okay. All right. Well, next up we have Ms. Zanya. Okay. So obviously it's very important to keep up with all of the ever-changing consumer trends out there. We know they want it now. They want it their way. And guess what? Great news is that you can give it to them. You can personalize their experience. And by personalizing your experience for the consumer, you're actually able to get real life trend data instead of waiting for three months, six months down the road, because personalization is only possible when you have interactive content. Just like Scott said, they want that immersive experience. So in order for you to personalize the experience for a consumer, you have to have interactive content. So what I love about interactive content is that it's like a flywheel, right? So interactive content is gonna drive pers personalization. Personalization is going to give you great engagement on your website. That in turn is going to generate a ton of data and we all know how important data is these days, especially with AI coming. If you have plans of implementing AI at some point, you have to have data because otherwise AI is just stupid, right? So with that data, you're able to make some really great smart decisions for your business because you can see real time what are consumers doing? What are they engaging with? What's resonating with them? And then not only can you improve your products, what you're offering to them, but you can also improve your marketing because you can see that everybody loves that blue house with the you know, gray stone. So you can go ahead and serve that in your next marketing campaign. And again, Flywheels goes all around improving your marketing, improving personalization, improving engagement, and so on and so forth. So I like to think of it as almost like an infinite wheel that keeps spinning. And what happens in the process is that not only you have happier consumers when you serve personalized content, you also have better profitability because you're able to uh, maximize um, all that information that you're getting and uh, position your product better. And your cost acquisition is also going down because that marketing just tends to resonate with the consumers. So we're going to take a look at some great examples of interactive content. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the benefits, not only for consumers, but also for home builders and use cases. So 
Here is an example of an exterior visualizer. This is one of the most popular uh, digital tools that we see home builders use. And it's because it allows your consumers to really picture their future home, right? They're not just looking at a house, they're looking at their house. They're able to select all of the finishes, they're able to select all of the design features and really visualize themselves living in this home. That in turn creates great emotional connection. We know that when consumers have an ability to look at a virtual tour, for example, of a home before they tour it, they fall in love with it. And as they fall in love with it, they're much more likely to purchase that home as they go to actually see it in person. Because then again, they can see it themselves, their choices, they start to fall in love with all the finishes. It also leads to faster conversion. So instead of, um, you know, let's face it, when you buy new construction home, it's very risky. Right? You're spending a ton of money and most people can't imagine what the home is going to look like. So you run into these objections like, oh, I just can't see it. I don't know what this $20,000 option is going to look like, so I better not risk it. I better buy a used home. At least I can see what it looks like. Well, where, when you're implementing something like this, a virtual tour that allows you to show some of your most popular features built in and consumers can see what that option is actually going to look like, it allows you to sell them much quicker. They can say yes to that much faster because, hey, I can actually see what that looks like. It reduces the risk for me and allows me to move forward. It also creates higher engagement. So it's a no brainer, right? When they go to your website and they have the tools that they can interact with instead of just looking at a stale picture, they spend more time on your website engaging with the tools. So when they're spending more time on your website, it creates that stickiness that we all like to talk about, which sends a signal to Google gods that, hey, this website <laughs> must be awesome because people are actually sticking around on it. So it reduces the bounce rates and in turn improves your SEO. So give them different tools that they're able to play around with. For example, um, even a mortgage calculator, when you provide pricing for options and you um, add in a mortgage calculator, you're able to, again, overcome a lot of those objections, right? Like, oh, I don't know if I wanna add that $20,000 option, but hey, it's only $15 a month or whatever that may be. <laughs> so really um, give them something to, to stick around for. Now, this is my favorite part about interactive content, and it's the fact that you see exactly what your consumers are doing online. So I wish I had this when I was selling new construction because, oh boy, oh boy, I, <laughs> I would have really made a lot of money then. So, right, after your consumers go through the process of selecting their exterior choices, interior choices, they have selected their floor plan choices, the colors, options, you can see exactly what they did. They can actually go all the way through to buy that home online, like Melissa was saying, or they can reserve a home site, or at the very least, they're going to save their favorite. And when they save that favorite, that lead comes to you with their contact information. So now as a salesperson, oh my gosh, this is like I'm serving it to you on the golden platter, right? Uh, we literally have consumers coming into the model home with the brochure in hand saying, this is exactly what I want. So this is by far my favorite feature about this, as you can see every single thing that your consumers are doing online. And in turn, you can also aggregate all of that data. So every single thing that the consumers are doing, you can pull that information, whether it's by community, by region, by your entire company, and you can see what are the most popular or least popular floor plans? What are the most popular options, colors? So again, you as a home builder are able to pivot very quickly and make smart decisions. Hey, everybody wants smaller footprint. Let's offer smaller homes. And in turn, optimization. So optimization is where you're able to launch really targeted marketing campaign based on what your customers are doing. So again, if your customers want to see that Tesla-like experience, you can show them that we have Tesla-like experience on our website. You can buy a home entirely online. You can make all those selections just like with Tesla. 
And so, again, if you know people from California, love to see that blue home with the gray stone, right? Serve it to them. If you know people from Florida, love that Spanish style type of looking home with stucco, show that to them. So your marketing continues to improve and your lead acquisition goes down over time when you offer interactive content. Now at Anugo, we always like to follow the latest consumer trends. And so one of the things that is becoming popular with the rise of ChatGPT, how many of you guys are using AI tools already for searches, et cetera? Great. Is we call it the conversational e-commerce. This is when people are actually starting to make purchases through interacting with voice, right? And we've seen this with Alexa, and now Amazon launched their own Ruffus, which will be selling homes on Amazon. And what that Ruffus is able to do is it's able to communicate with consumers real time, and it's not your old school chatbot that was decision tree based, right? This new chatbot is able to get really in-depth information and answer questions from consumers based on all the reviews, based on all the previous interactions, based on the warranty information, et cetera. Now, we love that idea of, um, of talking to your consumers, but one thing that's missing for home building is interactivity because we're so visual in home building. What we're trying to do next is we're trying to take today's interface of, okay, the consumer has to go online, they have to find at home, they have to personalize it, to now voice. You can just go in and say, hey, I would love to have five bedroom home with such and such features, boom, does this look like it? Sure, okay, I would love to see it in Tar Heel Blue. It changes it for you. And as it changes it for you, you can go back and interact with that and in turn, it, it's gonna serve you more information on, hey, maybe you should consider this option. So this is something that we're working on at Anugo to bring conversational comers to home builders. So this would be something that goes on your website in, in place of your chat bot. And last thing I just wanted to talk to you about is, again, people are starting to use ChatGPT to search for new homes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you don't have information on your website that ChatGPT is able to grab, <laughs> if you're gating your content, especially if you're gating your interactive content, guess what? AI is not going to go and register <laughs> to sign up to play with your interactive content. So if it's not able to access your interactive content on your website, it's going to return the result of, oh, that builder does not offer this option. Sorry. So we're going to eliminate you. We're moving on to the next uh, builder who has this option. So it's just something to keep in mind is that with your website, you're no longer trying to appeal just to a human, but now you're actually trying to appeal to AI. And AI doesn't care about the colors. AI doesn't care about your brand standards. AI doesn't care about pretty buttons. AI cares about information. So do you have the information available on your website? And is it readily available? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Where, what's Tar Hill Blue? Yeah, I've never heard Tar Hill. <laughs> Is that a national thing? Or? It must be North Carolina thing. <laughs> okay, just wondering. All right. Well, Tim, take it away. Perfect. That's hard to follow all that beautiful product online like that. And I come in and talk about like reviews, customer reviews. <laughs> Who likes customer reviews? <laughs> Few people, right? <laughs> cool. Because I came. I got up at two thirty in the morning for this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just to get everyone, this is actually a, a, a status I've borrowed from my friends at Zillow here. But you know, looking at you know, to sum it up, the net out of this is if you look at today's home buyers, they have a bit more time than did a year ago or two years ago. So, what do you think that means? More time. More what would you do if you had more time to make a decision? Research. More and more research. So that's what we're going to dig into a little bit to see some of the tools that they're using. Um, we know that today's home buyers are connected. We're all connected. We're all hyper connected, right? We've got five phones here. So when you start thinking about today's home buyers, the first thing that came to mind to me is, you know, where are they going to start searching for their new home? And according to the National Association of Realtors' most recent report, it was 100% online. And that's up from 96% the year before. And then the next stat I found is like, well, did reviews even matter? Who thinks reviews matter in home building? Our space has been kind of immune for a little bit, but they matter. We do a study, a home buyer preference study each year. We're finding that 81% of respondents find that reviews matter. And they don't just matter when they're searching and qualifying and disqualifying. They matter in that final decision-making process. 
So it's important stuff. And it all comes down to this. It's because today, this, it's social proof. Yeah. And I was thinking about that as I was flying in today. Like, when you, like, what decisions do we make where we don't look at reviews now? It's crazy. It's kind of crazy. Like I, I didn't go to Home Depot on the weekend without checking reviews first. I was like, "Good, it's in stock. That'll save me some time." Oh, good. This is a, oh, it's a four and nine. I'm not risking this here. There's a, lots of people bought it, so it, it's become this idea of social proof. We look at how others behave, and that determines how we're going to behave. And there's been some studies done. This was um, Northwestern University did a study. I thought this was pretty wicked. They found that a product without reviews versus that same product with just five reviews, it drove conversion by 270 percent. Five reviews, and it took it up that much. Because again, as humans, we don't want to make, we don't risk anything. So it's, it's again just this Amazon world we live in. And there's a couple of things with the world of reviews too, and I'm sure we all know this. But as a consumer, we typically look for two factors. We look for a freshness, I call it a freshness or currency of the reviews, and we look for a volume of reviews. So again, we don't want to make that risky decision based on oh, there's two reviews and they're from four years ago. I'm not going to go to that resort. I'm not booking that hotel. We want to see stuff that's coming in currently. You know, I want to see the, the, the skill saw that was bought last week. I want to see the resort that was stayed at. Someone just came home yesterday. And I want to see lots of it. I want to see fluid reviews and a good volume of reviews. So that's you know, the social proof we're looking for today. And this is a beautiful thing. I've been in this industry since I was 15. Can't get out of it. Um, my dad was a site super. So 15 years old, you're getting in the truck, you're going to the job site, paid my way through university that way. And I've never, it kind of gave me a passion for this. But we are a beautifully photoshopped industry. And it's really hard to crack that nut. <laughs> it's really hard to break that, to show that, you know, we're, we're real. We're not infallible here. And when it came to the world of reviews, when we started working with some of our clients on that, the first reaction was, oh, God, no. Like, no, 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 no. We're not pushing that out there. We're real. We're, we're perfect. we got to be perfect or people won't buy from us. But you look at this, I threw a few stats up here. But, you know, consumers want to see good and bad. 68% trust the sites more if there's both good and bad reviews out there. We do this all the time, too. You know, you expect if you see only the good stuff. If you go to a site that's got all five-star reviews, what do you think right away? It's fake. It's gamed. It's filtered. It's, there's something going on. Like, we don't trust. Trust. That's the other little thing, too. Consumer trust today is that is the, the default is mistrust. Right? We come in mistrusting. we got to build that up then, right? So with this default being mistrust, they're going to suspect, oh, that can't be real. Uh, what was kind of cool in some of the research I was doing, though, is that the people that actually read through a lot of negative reviews can be some of the best prospects. Like, they're highly engaged. And I think, you know, again, we do, I read the one-star reviews first, right? Because you jump to the ones, you filter by the ones. I want to see if that is going to affect my buying criteria or not. And if not, it's like, cool. You know, I don't care if the hot tub didn't work at that resort. You know, <laughs> I'm, not going, I'm not going to the Caribbean for a hot tub. So you can, you know, bypass certain things that way. And if we don't get proactive with our online reputations as companies, as brands today, there's two biases that factor in here. And it's just you know, basic psychology, but the first one is called selection bias. So if you're not proactively out there managing and marketing your reputation, you'll get this thing called selection bias that factors in on the public review sites like Google, like Yelp, like Consumer Affairs. And what selection bias is, is the unhappies will find that site. Right? They will, they will set up a Google account, they'll log into their Google account, they'll set up a Yelp account. And so what you'll see on those public sites is they'll be swayed towards, we call them detractor customers, uh, but you're unhappies. But then the other factor that definitely influences this as well is something called social influence bias. And what that is, is I, I had an okay experience. Yes, I'll go put an online review on Yelp or Google or whatever it is. I was going to go four star, but then I get on there and I see a whole bunch of two and a half or three star. Well, maybe I'll go 3.9. I don't want to be that guy that goes against the flow, right? So you start to see that some of that downward trend happens on the public sites. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to be really, you know, having mechanisms, having strategies that collect feedback, that collect reviews and push that stuff out there. You can't, again, just leave your reputation to chance. We did a little down and dirty study a few years ago of just a sample of our client base. And it was kind of fun to do. We were like, let's look at a random sample. We work with builders across North America, all sizes. Let's see how they look on the public review sites, Consumer Affairs, Yelp, Google, kind of the main ones. And on average, it came up at a 3.6. We looked at their same data in our platform, though, and they're coming up at a 4.1. But it's because, you know, with the platform, we're, we're actually enticing, we're not enticing, we're attracting people, we're, we're asking them to take the survey, the builders are asking them to take surveys to get the reviews and the ratings built up. So you're getting, they call it a J-curve, not to get off topic too far, but you get a J-curve 
of the review distribution, which means you're gonna get your unhappies, the one stars, but if you plot them out, then you get less and less twos and threes, but then you usually get this tail. So if you get the right sample size, you'll get a J-curve that translates to public review sites, to Avid sites, things like that as well. And by taking that stuff, that good stuff, collecting the feedback, pushing it out, it's a little bit of online judo. So you know, there's, there's still gonna be the unhappies that find these other sites. Um, but you know, you want to push that offending content down wherever possible. They always joke the you know, mm -hmm. best place to hide a dead body is third page of Google. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody looks there. <laughs> so, so I wanted to put a couple quick examples up here as well, some builder examples, uh, good and bad. So this is a client we work with, and I was pretending here, you know, I'm a Toronto boy. You probably tell from my accent, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but I, I want to buy a place in Orlando. I want to snowbird down there. So I started Google searching some builders down there. It's like, hey, Meritage, what do they look like for reviews? We well, can see in the top left there, you know, they've got 1,590 reviews. It's about a 4.5 star builder. You know, it looks pretty solid. You know, it shows up on the Google My Discovery panel or Google My Business panel on the bottom right there as well. If that wasn't being pushed out though, if we weren't proactively collecting stuff, pushing it out there, optimizing it, what would they look like? You know, first hit would be Yelp. You know, 1.5 stars, 29 reviews, you know, over in the side panel, you know, 3.1 star on Google. But look, like for the size of a Meritage Orlando division, is 33 Google reviews representative of their actual performance? And, and again, as a consumer, where would your eyes migrate? <laughs> You'd probably go to the, the ones that's flowing in reviews in more volume, more freshness as well. And the other trick is, shout out to my friends down the table here, you also have to be in more than one spot. You know, as a consumer, if I'm putting down the biggest purchase price in my life, I'm not just gonna check out one spot. I'm doing my homework. So I'm gonna be looking reviews here, reviews there. I'm gonna be looking at product. I'm gonna be hoping it's personalized with immersive experiences. But so there, when, with marriage, I can go into Zillow too and see, okay, they got reviews there as well. I can kind of assure myself it's not too risky a decision. And to save harmlessly, other ones, I tried to block out all these names, and it was a really bug it was a bugger to do. Uh, but <laughs> and it's kind of fugly, I will say. Uh, but <laughs> when you look at this here, um, this is just another builder in Orlando. So again, a Toronto boy looking to snowboard for retirement in Orlando, and this is another builder I came across. And look at how this one <clears throat> looks. Which one would you decide to migrate towards for your like? Which one would you disqualify? You know, there's a lot of good material there, but so I, which one am I going to disqualify? Oh, that one looks. Uh, I'm not going to waste my time driving to that community. So it's, you know, it's, this is what our world has become, is how you know, the inspiration discovery stages and disqualification stages are happening with tools that you know, we have to get ahead of as an industry. So a few you know, last leave off tips here. Uh, I think be, you know, we can't fully control our reputations as companies anymore. Um, that's impossible, that ship has sailed. But we can manage it, we can market it, we can really join conversations. A big piece of this is inspiring early, which we've all, I think, been talking about. Inspiration, discovery, it's all happening, happening online, it's all digital. There's all these tools that have to engage consumers online so we don't get disqualified. Um, the other one I've talked about, though, too, is to be proactive. Who's, who, do, who in here is proactive on, on their reviews and things like that? Anyone? We are. Yes, you guys are. Anybody else? Cool. I mean, this, otherwise we're letting the, the monster of the internet take co control of our brand totally. We can't fully control it, but we can get ahead of some of that. Um, and the other thing, I've actually talked to clients that said, we don't want to see any reviews. We don't want reviews online. It's like, you have to. Like, it's not, it's not just ours, anything. Um, you have to have it out there. No reputation today is, yeah, I'd rather have a bad reputation. Because no reputation means you're almost non-existent to consumers today. If you go online and you see a company or a product without any reviews, without you know, much of a website, without much immersion in their product offerings, it's not going to go anywhere. A big one, though, too, is responding, joining the conversation. Uh, and I think that I heard this at a, a, an event, too. The best analogy in my that really resonated to me, because I used to work for a builder for years. Um, and it was like, you got to treat the online world like it's your model home. So you wouldn't ignore people coming into your model home. You join the conversation, you ask some questions, you would engage. And that's the same way. Like you don't, It sounds like it's a big lift to try and engage and, and respond to online reviews, but the stats are just crazy. It's like 88% of consumers will actually trust the brand more if they're responding to every online review. It drops down to like 47% if they don't respond to any. So this is an opportunity to really Again, join that conversation, pretend it's the, the model home conversation and get responding out there. 
end of the day, this is all about authenticity. It's, you know, we hear it as a buzzword, but transparency, it just proves you're real. As a brand, as a company, it's like, yep, we've got some, I always call them online beauty marks. You know, uh, it's, you're going to have some online beauty marks, a few blemishes. Okay. That makes you real, right? That makes us honest. And there's a whole movement that way right now in our world. So that's pretty cool. Um, and I just think at the end of the day, you know, this opportunity to manage, but then also market your brand reputation, is it's more powerful than it's ever been. We've got more tools available than ever before. And it all comes down to trust. You know, all we're trying to do early in the stage and then all the way through to getting advocacy at a year after closing and two years after closing is trying to create buyer trust and homeowner trust. And that it starts, a lot of that starts with this social proof idea, getting that stuff out there. That's great. Well, and I, I think, you know, I'll ask this question I don't know the answer to, which you're never supposed to do, right? <laughs> but the second builder that you showed that had the bad reputation, I would venture to say they're not necessarily a bad builder. No, not at all. Right? Not at all. You know, no. I don't know who it was. Now I have to know. know. I'm going to go look in your Oh, you were going to go slide it over. Yeah, you know you I'm going to go look. You know. <laughs> Unredacted. Yeah. And if I was not nice, I would have like exposed what, you. Like, oh, like, I know. Yeah. That's why I didn't give her edit rights. Yep. <laughs> Fun, <laughs> Fun PowerPointing. Yeah. This is what goes on behind the scenes. Um, but I would venture to say they probably aren't a bad builder. Not at all. It's no. just that only the angry people bother to go rate their tacos and their house on Yelp, right? Like, I mean, that's just what you do. So, so true. Interesting. I love that. Thank you. Cool. All right. Is on my side? Oh, All right. We got two now. Please. Yeah, no, I got two. I can manage with both hands. <laughs> so, hi, everyone. My name is Monica Wheaton. I'm the Vice President of Customer Success over at ECI. And just a real quick um, little view. And wait, she was Woman of the Year. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And just, you know, she didn't put that on the slide. I, I yeah. Slide. And I, I wanted to mention it, so thank you. Oh, I mean, thank we're, you. we're so honored to have her. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm very humbled by it, but I really appreciate the recognition for sure. Yeah. But um, as I said, um, I'm from ECI, and so I just real quick wanted to show you just a little bit about what ECI is. We do have, um, many of you might know our, our tools, Mark Systems and Lasso, but we are actually across the building and construction community, we have uh, eight different products for the community. And my group really focuses on the builders and home uh, lot, uh, land developers and contractors and things like that. And so um, if you want to learn more, I can you know share some of that with you. Um, but what I wanted to do today is we're talking today about attracting the online shopper. And that's really great because 67% of prospects visited a home buyer's website to kick off their new home research. Mr. Uh, Greg Bray over there <laughs> from Blue Tangerine. Uh, thank you for that statistics. But um, so what, what we're talking about today is just using all these different tools to on, uh, attract these online home shoppers. And that's what you want to do because the more leads you can get, the more chances you have, right, to sell a home. So what you do, you're doing is you've got this little funnel. Well, not everybody's going to want to buy a home, right? So you're not going to catch every single one of them. And what's the goal once you go through like the... Uh, like the Zillow, the listing sites or the reviews or even some of these other tools you can use online is you want them to come to your front door, which is your website online. Um, once you get them there, you definitely want to have, as Anya was talking about, these online interactive tools. So you've got the 3D tours, the interactive floor plans, anything you can do to put on your website um, to increase that interactivity. Because the longer that buyers are on your site, the more likely they are to buy a home, right? And you would think that this would get most of the buyers engaged and get them, you know, wanting to purchase a home. But uh, as we've come to learn, um, we really aren't dealing with a funnel anymore with buyers, right? They're not just coming to your website, looking at your tools, going into your home center and buying a home. They have this sort of awareness consideration and then they do this research and discovery loop where some of them will come to purchase, but a lot of them don't. So they'll kind of circle around and they'll go back out to Zillow, they'll come back into your site, they'll play with the Matterhorn tour, the 3D tours, all those different things. Um, and eventually some of them will come to purchase. So what we want to do is we want to keep those uh, engagement tools on your website so that they can keep coming back with some variability there. So there's the, like I said, the 3D tours, the configurators, the interactive floor plans, um, chat bots. You can even take these interactive tools offline and maybe do an app or, uh, you know, engage with people through text and all those different things. Um, 
you want to be able to track their activity and save what they're doing, especially when they're on your website. So whenever they do or engage in anything, you want them to say, be able to save that activity. Like if it's an interactive floor plan and they're making changes to the floor plan, how cool is it to be able to then save your floor plan and have that where you can share with your family or anything like that? So they, you can have them enroll and fill out a form on your site. And this goes back to what Anya was saying about gating content, right? How are you gonna get uh, prospects to be playing on your website if you have it all gated? A lot of them, I mean, think about how many times you have to fill out a form to get information. It's annoying and maybe you don't want anybody calling you, right? But if you can get them in, track what they're doing behind the scenes and then before they leave, once they've personalized something, have them then fill out the form, you can capture all of that information in the back end. So what I wanted to talk about today is really the value of a CRM because you've got all these prospects that are doing all these different things with you and you're capturing some of them, but you're not necessarily getting all of them, right? Um, if you have a CRM, you can capture them and you can actually put plans in place uh, where you're communicating with them with if it's a B lead or a C lead or somebody who's not ready to buy yet today. So we've found in this McKinsey study that 15 to 20% there's been a 15 to 20% increased win rate when you do have a CRM, because once you get that registration, you don't have these things offline. You can create a sales plan. You can manage uh, the communications with that potential buyer. You can even nurture those ones who aren't ready to buy yet as well. And it really has helped to increase productivity quite a bit because it provides a way for the sales team to develop basically a process that they then can manage. So we're just gonna do some real quick hypothetical math here. So pretend you're a 60 home unit a year builder, right? And if you have a CRM, you're getting 15% more wins, we'll say. So that's actually nine more homes that you can sell per year. So that really ends up bumping up your numbers. And when you look at that in terms of sales of your home price, um, we're just, for easy math, gonna say that builders are 10% net profit. So this builder is selling $500,000 homes at a 10% net profit. You've got those nine more homes, you've got $450,000 more profit. Now I know that a straight sale doesn't necessarily end up with profit because there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes when you're selling nine more homes, so you have to be an efficient builder as well, but it really does have an impact on your bottom line. Um, so what a CRM can do for you is allow for increased personalization. It helps you track and understand how prospects come into your process as well. So you can not, uh, not just see that they're coming from the internet, you can see are they coming from Zillow, are they coming from Redfin, are they coming from wherever, how are they getting to your site. You can track their individual activity and interests, um, keep notes and records of prior engagements, and this goes back to what Melissa was talking about before, when you have somebody who's active online and they come into the sales center, they don't want to start all over with you. They want you, they don't want you to spy on them and you know, know everything about them, but they want you to know everything about them. They want the, you to know what house they're interested in and ask the right questions to dig out the information that they've shared with you online to get to the point of what they're there for. So you really want to create, you know, obviously personalized experiences, uh, set regular, regular follow-up processes for all leads type, and this is actually going to end up in you closing a lot more deals by having a CRM. So instead of doing this, where we're only capturing part of our leads that are coming through and to our website and engaging with us on those lead directories and every, everything else we put out there, reviews and all of that, you're actually starting to do this where everything is connected now to the CRM and you're tracking from everywhere that you have an engagement. So there's that much more opportunity to sell and close deals. Um, trying to get through this pretty fast because we don't have a lot of time. I wanna make sure you have some time to talk. So hopefully all this makes sense and you have no questions. All right. <laughs> and I won't cover this in too much detail because I think no, you will. No, that's good. So, um, so this, uh, this graph really, sh or this triangle really just shows, and again, it's funnel shape, but we know it's not really a funnel, but this one kind of is because you have, like I said, the lead directories and websites, only one to 2% of those end up in the CRM if they did. When a lead is in a CRM, 40% of those in the CRM will go to appointment and 20% of those go uh, to a sale. So you're increasing again your whole opportunity for sales by 15 to 20%, 15 to 20% more sales that you can make through the year with the CRM. 
So um, stay on that for a second. Oh, yep, You're going to see that again in my section, and we didn't get together on this. <laughs> yeah, not at all. So this so, is good. So <laughs> yeah, it's these numbers work. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Um, and then just to finish off, what does all this activity look like in your CRM? So uh, going back to what Anya was saying about managing from data, you want to be able to track what you're having and what's having an impact, what you should focus on, uh, where you're getting your leads and things like this. And so uh, this will just show you, uh, you know, traffic and when is the traffic coming in? Because that's actually very important as well. How much traffic are you getting? When are they coming into your sales center and all of that stuff? Um, this is registrant by source, and this is what I was talking about. It's really small, I'm sorry about that, but you can see how many, uh, how many people are coming in through online sources. But you can also dig deeper into that. So you can see several of those leads came in through Insert, several of them through, I believe, uh, LotView and Zillow, I think is up at the top. Um, so you can, again, really dive in and track what's working for you and your company. Uh, and this is, uh, oh, you can also track by community and what their ratings are so you can focus on where it counts. And then this is the best part. You can spy on your sales staff and make sure they're doing all of their tasks. <laughs> right? <laughs> Another really good, valuable part about a CRM. And that leads right into me. Hey, okay. So I think no, this is, I'm actually, that's my last slide. So I will actually hand it over. So this oh, is just, uh, yeah, I'll just read this real quick. Technology creates new opportunities to work differently and working differently creates new opportunities to infuse technology into the working process. So be open to new discoveries. That's really yeah. all I need to say. Thank well, you. And I think, I mean, I think the important part, you know, I kind of look at your piece is you can do all these amazing marketing activities, but if you're not catching them and tracking them and working them, why bother, right? Like, so it's almost like you really want to, you know, track through that and love spying on salespeople. That's super fun. Um, <laughs> and then next up, we have Roxanne. So oh. I'm last, and I'm a salesperson. I know I've already been sitting still way longer than I'm used to sitting still. So I'm going to stand up. I hope that's okay. And I know you guys over here, I want to make sure you're hearing everything we're saying. Okay, this but before you start, we have a little story about Roxanne. Oh. And this is like a philosophical story. So how many people think salespeople are just born salespeople versus, you know, nurture versus nature? How many think they're just born? Okay, all right, okay. So Roxanne, little little story about Roxanne, she was like the number one Girl Scout cookie sales leader in her <laughs> early years. So, in second grade. <laughs> so that's not an actual picture of Roxanne, but you know, you get the picture. So anyway, they're born. I think they're I born. did send you my Girl Scout picture one time. I know, and I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. Oh gosh, thank you so much. Anyway, so um, what a great session this has been. And I'm so glad that I'm going last. Melissa is just a genius as she puts these things together. Um, if you're going to spend all this time doing all of these things that each of these panelists have talked about, if you're not doing this end piece, which is Monica did great leading into me, you're spending a whole bunch of money and you're not getting back what you should be getting back. And so that's what I'm going to try and focus on. So let's talk about what goes through the mind of a consumer when they first think about getting into a home. Well, they want to find a home that's desirable, reliable, and attainable. But they also want a home that's going to meet their wants, their needs, and their desires. So what does a builder want? A builder wants a marketing department that's going to tie into all of those wants and needs, right? And what does the sales team want? The sales team just wants the lead. They want to find the person, they want to determine who is willing to buy and able to buy and has urgency to buy, and they want to connect with them on that customer's hot buttons, right? So your website is doing all of this, and you guys are doing a great job. I asked for a list of the people that were coming to this conference, and I went online and I looked at some of your websites, and I know that you're putting the work in to do a lot of this stuff already. But what's important to that customer from a customer service perspective? So we're talking about reviews and what does customer service look like to the customer that we sell to or the customer that walks in the door. But what does it look like to the digital customer? The digital customer wants photos, videos, and we know they want 3D tours, right? Because we just heard that today. They want flexible interaction. That means if they like to text, 
they want somebody to text them. If they like to talk on the phone, they want somebody that can talk on the phone with them. If they want emails, they want somebody that can email. If they're social media people, they want to see you on social media. So the digital customer wants flexible interaction. So however they like to communicate, you're that type of communicator. But what they also want is this last one. And we're already doing the first two as an industry. But this last one, very few builders have tapped into this. And they want 15 minute response time. It's that Amazon syndrome that we talked about. Speed wins. So if you don't remember anything about my section, remember photos, flexible, and 15 minutes. Write that down. I don't see anybody writing that down. <laughs> Write that down. Because this 15 minutes is like really important. So how do you get to a 15 minute response time? Well, the first thing is you have to have an internet sales team. So I work for a very big builder, but in my builder, we have 21 divisions. And in our 21 divisions, I have a division that has one community. It's a brand new division we're opening. And I have huge mega, mega divisions that have 27 to 30. And these numbers work whether you're a small builder like my division with one community or you're a larger builder. And if you, if you don't have an internet sales team, everything that you're doing and all the money that you're spending is not getting you the revenue that you're already spending money to get. And this is what a sales team looks like. You should have two designated online sales counselors, not an on-site salesperson that answers the phone and takes digital leads. Because what happens to an on-site salesperson? Somebody walks in the door, they get busy, they're walking in a model, they're walking home under construction, they've got a closing coming up, they're walking to make sure the home is ready. They're not there to answer the phone and to handle a digital customer. I guarantee you, your digital leads are not being taken care of if you're turning it over to on-site. They're also not being taken care of if you're turning it over to your sales manager. Because what is your sales manager doing? They're putting out fires. They're trying to get more sales for the week. They're doing all of the things that they do as a manager. They're not there to service the digital customer. <clears throat> so that two designated salespeople is very important. And I'm going to cover in a second what, excuse me, what kind of buckets they can fill so that you can always keep them busy, even if you don't have enough digital leads coming in. You want two internet salespeople so that you've got seven day a week coverage. We are a retail business. The internet never closes 24 seven. So you want staggered hours. You necessarily don't want your internet team working the same hours as your onsite team, right? Because you have people on the internet at nine o'clock at night and you have them at six o'clock in the morning. And that doesn't mean that your internet people have to work 24 seven. But if you stagger those hours, you can figure out for your region and for your price point, which hours you should be working. Here's what we found with those staggered hours. If you have a price point where you sell a lot of upper management and business owners, they tend to be on the internet after working hours. If you're targeting a first time buyer and a lower price point, they tend to be on the internet at one o'clock after lunch. Does that make sense? On their mm -hmm. boss's time. <laughs> I'm just saying that's how it is. <laughs> so you better make sure that you're covering those staggered hours. Now, how much can, a, can, how much can a, an internet sales team handle? So we just heard that 100% of the leads coming to us right now are going on the internet. So when I kind of did some deep diving into my team a couple of years ago, I found that I had my on-site salesperson handling about 150 leads a month, a month, and I had my internet person handling 1,000 leads a month. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, but they do different jobs. But your internet person is not just a conduit. They're not just a switchboard. They're your first salesperson that your consumer that you're trying to turn into a customer is dealing with. They are truly salespeople. So if you look at how much traffic you're driving into your website and you don't have an internet team to handle them, take that funnel picture that Monica showed us and those people are bubbling up the top. I know you guys probably change your oil or if you're, if you cook a, if you're a cake maker and you pour batter down a funnel, if the neck of that funnel 
is not wide enough, what happens to either that oil or that cake batter, whatever you happen to be doing? It bubbles out the top, right? Your number of salespeople on your internet team is the neck of that funnel. So how do you know how many you need? So this is, these are the numbers that are the sweet spot. An internet salesperson should handle about 50 leads a week. And if they're converting 40% of those to an appointment, that's 20 appointments a week, that's four a day. If you give your internet salesperson clear direction on what is a successful day for them, you will get four appointments a day, five days a week from every internet salesperson you have. Why? Because you've given them clear direction. If they think they're just there answering the phone, they're gonna give you all the leads that they talk to that day and you're not gonna have anything to show for it. So if they can handle 50 leads a week, 20 appointments a week, that's four a day, the show rate for internet people, that your internet consumer is usually further down the funnel when they're willing to make an appointment. So their show rate is about 65%. So those 20 appointments will equal 13 completed appointments. Your on-site salesperson, if they're making five appointments, half of them won't show up, half will, and of the half that will, one will buy. That's a 50% completed rate and a 10% conversion rate. And look at these numbers for internet, a 65% show rate and a 20% purchase rate. Not only do they show up, but they're way more willing to buy. So this success funnel where I have 40% of your leads turn to appointments and 20% of those appointments turn to a sale, which equate to about 40% of your overall sales for the year should come from your internet leads. That's exactly what, right? Is yeah, that right? Right. <laughs> right. These numbers, the numbers don't lie. These numbers tell a story. Go back from this session, not maybe today, when you go back to your, you know, wherever you're from, pull out these numbers for your own company. Pull out these numbers by community. If you're a builder that has multiple communities, look at it by community. How, how many leads are being filtered from your on-site salesperson to a particular community? And then what's happening with those? Because sometimes there's, I'm not gonna lie, sometimes there's a disconnect between the on-site salesperson and the internet salesperson. And you need to make sure that those handoffs go clear, but that's a whole nother panel session, right? <laughs> okay, uh, let's see, what's next? So if, if you're a really small, small builder and you're not getting 50 leads a week and you're thinking, well, you would actually have to get 100 to have two people. Well, I'm not getting 100 leads a week. What am I gonna do with my um, online sales account? Sounds sales counselor and I'm paying them and I'm not giving them enough to do, but look at all the buckets that they can fill. You're not just your website and internet, you've got your MLS listings, which are huge right now. You can have your phone calls transferred from your individual communities into them. Because what happens on our phone now with our click to call? Our phone calls are skyrocketing again. Are your on-site people there to answer the phone? No, they're not. Because if they have somebody calling them, they're calling them on their cell phone because their customers now have their cell phone number. So any number that you have going to your on-site community, mm -hmm. your sales counselor more than likely is not answering it. Transfer it to your internet salesperson. The realtors are finding that, hey, instead of calling out and talking to a community, I'm gonna call the internet person because they know all of the things about the builder. So now they have a one-stop shop person to go to, which is your online sales counselor. They're also working your grand openings. I call them suspects versus prospects, right? So your grand openings, instead of waiting for your grand opening to get really close to opening and you've assigned salesperson, you can start your interest list when you buy that land and you put that sign up, right? Because now you have a person that can start taking calls. Um, and the last one, those people that are not ready for an appointment, your internet people will continue prospecting them so that they can keep that relationship going until they are ready to purchase. Like a reload, we sell military people. We work with military people for like six months before they're ready to make a decision. So there's buckets that you can fill your online sales counselor with to keep them busy if you're a smaller builder and your digital leads are not coming in at 100 a week yet. Okay, so what do builders as a rule look like? This is, um, do you convert? Mike Lyon, I, I love him. I think him and Kevin Oakley are like at the top of their game when it comes to internet sales. 
They, they surveyed hundreds of builders in 2023, and this is what they found. 52% of the builders who were contacted online had a no response rate. So if you at least return it, you're ahead of the game right there. 61% did not have a, a, an ability to text. So they got a text, there was no way to contact them back on a text. So again, if you have a text system filled up, then you're ahead of the game right there. And emails, 21% um, no response to an email. This is like sales 101. Think of all of the money that you're spending and you're not even sending an email. You have no email cadence for these people coming in. We can do better than this. I mean, think about it. We're calling these people to us. We're saying, come see me. I want to sell you a home. And then they come and we don't even call them back or we don't email them back, right? We can do better than that. Yeah, so there was one more slide. And what do you think the percentage is of builders that respond in 15 minutes? Anybody? Close. 5%. Who else? It's 9%. So you were close. So it's a little bit better. We're a little bit better than what you thought. So if you can respond within 15 minutes, you are in the top 90% of any builder that a consumer is going to reach out to. You can do that, right? Everybody raise your hand. I pledge, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you can do that. So in conclusion, and um, we already heard it today, your website is your virtual community. You would never spend the money to have a model and a, and a model home park and not staff it, right? So think about your website as your virtual community. Staff it, check it daily have com sales commitments for them, mystery shop them, and win the consumer and turn them into a customer. And when it's run right, when your online business is run right, it is a game changer for your company. Awesome, drop the mic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. there we go, yeah. awesome. <laughs> Another reason I couldn't sit down because I'm using my hands. <laughs> awesome. Well, we are magically like at the magic moment when we need to wrap up. So we really don't have too much. We have like two minutes. So we're going to do the speed round. I took Scott's extra time, right? And it was perfect. It worked out perfectly. I'm just going to ask each panelist to go down the line. You get to go first, lucky oh, you. Oh, boy. Yeah. It's about that cat dog thing. No, I would like to know what's your one piece of advice that you would give to our builders? Uh, put your buyer hats on and, and walk in their shoes. Uh, it's not about you, it's about them. Awesome. I'm gonna say if you've relied on SEO all these years, don't rely on SEO anymore because <laughs> AI does not care about SEO, it cares about what's actually on your website. So you gotta invest in great content. Boy, I didn't know there was a question. Um, I would say no. be persuasively imperfect. Ah. Embrace being persuasively imperfect. I would say just uh, get the value out of what you invest. Capture all those leads. Run your business by the numbers. The numbers don't lie. Awesome. All right. Well, let's give a hand to our panelists. Woo! Woo! <laughs> all right.